Just before we get started, I will say that this video is brought to you by Beard Blaze. Some of you may have heard of this before, but I have another channel called Business Blaze, and that actually led to the very development of this product. Long story short, I made a joke on that channel about how YouTubers all have beauty ranges, and a fan of that channel actually emailed me and like, Simon, don't start a beauty range, but I can actually help you launch a beard oil. So we made it happen. Beard Blaze makes a full, luscious beard a reality, solving all of life's problems with facial hair. Not a guarantee. Life's problem, that is. This will make your beard awesome. So the guy who emailed me, Will, we teamed up. He sent me a bunch of samples. I rubbed them into my beard like some sort of experimental lab animal. And uh, this is what we ended up developing. A range of beard oils that I think are perfect for people's beards. Surprise, surprise. Also, I looked at problems I'd had with beard oils in the past, which was they're wildly expensive. And they come in these tiny little bottles. So I made a proper sized bottle and we uh, made it available at a fair price. So if you go to beardblaze.com, you will see a whole bunch of beard oils. You can choose one that will suit your beard. For example, if you've got beard dandruff, which is a thing, I've never had it, but apparently it's a thing. We made a beard oil that will help with that. Fantastic. Beardblaze.com, no specific offers or anything like that because it's mine and we just made fair prices. So link below and let's get into the video. From dubious documents and buried treasure to nefarious charlatans and ancient coded messages, when it comes to alluring tales of undecipherable encryptions, there's really nothing not to like. This sounds like a trailer for a movie this summer. Like out of place artifacts and enigmatic archaeological sites, they have an uncanny knack for defying expectation and pitting scientists, cryptographers, and historians against one another in feuds that often last for centuries. Those people lived a really long time if that went, you know. Some written in English and other languages are as easy to read as magazines or newspapers, but they're often open to numerous interpretations ranging from the painfully mundane to the downright unbelievable. Others contain obscure images, symbols, numbers, and letters that may or may not be decipherable codes at all. That said, if all of this sounds interesting, get comfy, because we're about to take a closer look at four lesser known mysterious encryptions. The Beale ciphers or Beale papers are a set of three ciphertexts which supposedly disclose the location of more than 3,000 pounds of gold, 5,000 pounds of silver, and assorted precious stones that, on today's market, could be valued at more than 100 million US dollars. Of the three texts, only the second containing a description of the treasure has been cracked, while the first and third, which give its precise location and the identity of its owners and their kin, have not. The story goes all the way back to 1820, when a man named Thomas J. Beale allegedly gave a box containing mysterious and unreadable documents to a local innkeeper before disappearing forever. The uninterested innkeeper subsequently stuffed the items in a closet for more than two decades before curiosity finally got the better of him. But after briefly studying the contents, he apparently forgot about it for another 20 years before giving it to a friend who spent decades attempting to crack the ciphertext's codes and finding the treasure, of which he was unable to determine its location in the most general of terms. According to him, it was located somewhere in Bedford County, Virginia, an expanse of land covering approximately 753 square miles, really narrowing it down. <laughs> Unable to solve the remaining ciphertext, he ultimately gave up and urged his friend James B. Ward to publish a pamphlet in 1885, hoping it would stir public interest interest and possibly wrangle up someone who could solve the mystery and uncover the precious metals and gems. The pamphlet claims that Beale had been part of a group of more than two dozen men who'd stumbled upon the treasure in the early 19th century while hunting in Buffalo in what was then Spanish territory, Santa Fe de Nueva Mexico, or currently the state of Colorado. Legend has it that the treasure was so immense that the team spent nearly a year and a half extracting it from the mine shaft where it had been hidden, after which Beale was charged with transporting it to Virginia for burial in a secret location. Since the story Story ciphertexts and pamphlets emerge, numerous attempts have been made to solve the mystery once and for all, but all of them have failed. Some who've delved into the story even claim that it's a hoax, plain and simple. For example, world-renowned cryptographers cite discovering evidence that prove the documents couldn't have been written when claimed because, among other things, they include words that weren't commonly used until decades later. The ciphertexts were also subjected to scrutiny by Sperry's Univac supercomputer in the 1960s, and scientists claim that, although they've been poorly encoded, the documents did contain intelligently placed texts that couldn't have appeared randomly, though the computer was unable to determine their meaning. Other expert cryptographers assert that there's absolutely no evidence that the two remaining ciphertexts are 
anything more than random and meaningless strings of characters. In addition, writing experts who analyzed the text determined that it was almost certainly written by James B. Ward, the man who published the pamphlet in 1885, which brought the whole affair to light, subsequently making him a regional celebrity of sorts. It's even suggested that famously deranged author Edgar Allan Poe was the hoax's perpetrator, largely because he lived and studied in the area, was known to be a lover of unsolved mysteries, and he frequently placed requests in newspapers, inviting readers to submit coded messages, which he often succeeded in solving. Alas, we'll probably never know the truth, at least until some unsuspecting hayseed hits pay dirt while digging for earthworms in rural Bedford County. If there's anything there at all, it could just be an elaborate prank, right? <coughs> From pictures of unidentifiable plants and indecipherable texts to strange watermarks and possible references to the birth of Christ, since its discovery in Hungary more than 200 years ago, the Rohans Codex has baffled and intrigued fans of arcane mysteries around the world. Named after Wilfred Wojnarch, a Polish bookseller who bought it in 1912, the Wojnarch manuscript's history may date back as much as four centuries earlier. The book came to light in the early 19th century when it was part of the personal library of a prominent Hungarian count who later in life donated his expansive collection to the country's Academy of Sciences. Curators cataloging the items noted that the codex resembled numerous historic medieval Hungarian texts that they'd seen before, but though it bore similarities to them, its nearly 450 pages contained scores of unrecognizable and likely coded writing that included a wide variety of shapes and symbols, as well as more than 80 drawings of obscure plants, military campaigns, and images of Christian, Hindu, and Islamic stories. A relatively recent radiocarbon dating tests have determined that the vellum on which the text is written dates from the early 1400s, but though experts in various fields have attempted to validate its authenticity and meaning, as well as the identity of its author, their efforts have been largely unsuccessful. It's generally agreed that, at the very least, it does contain elements of multiple languages, from Hindu to Old Hungarian, but even so, the recognition recognizable script is dwarfed by the confusing coded portion, which researchers have determined may contain nearly ten times more characters than any other known alphabet. Likewise, each of the Codex's papers includes a watermark featuring an anchor inside a circle framed within a radiant star, which has been dated back to the 1530s, or about a hundred years before the texts were reportedly written, leading some to claim that it is a copy of an original work that's probably long gone. Scholars ultimately theorize that it's everything from a previously undiscovered derivation of Latin to an Indian and Brahmi scripts, or a historical account of the Bakli people who fought against the Hungarians in an invasion in the 11th and 12th centuries. This does bear some weight based on the following translated excerpt. In great numbers, in the fierce battle, without fear go, go as a hero, break ahead with great noise to sweep away and defeat the Hungarian. But as is often the case, there seems to exist some evidence to support each theory, even though so-called experts can't agree on the text's origination and whether it's meant to be read from left to right or vice versa. Though the various theories and their supporting evidence are largely incomplete, inconclusive, and prone to professional disagreement, in the 20th century the manuscript was subjected to computer-based analysis. However, if the Codex contains one true overarching encryption, it has remained stubbornly hidden to even the analytical powers of modern computers. Hence, many see this as definitive proof that the majority of its contents are undecipherable, and if that's the case, it may in fact be a hoax, and many scholars point to a man named Samuel Litterai Niemes, who lived from 1796 to 1840. 42 as the most likely culprit. A Hungarian antiquarian of Transylvanian descent and co-founder of Budapest's National Library, he is known to have been a prolific forger who did much of his best work around the time that the Codex found its way into the spotlight. Though no evidence directly linking him to the work has ever been discovered, many scholars consider it a clear-cut case of fraud that warrants no additional study, while others, of course, disagree, because of course they're going to. Elberton, Georgia, home of the Georgia Guidestones, is referred to as the granite capital of the world for good reason. Located 110 miles northeast of Atlanta, the town of 4,600 sits atop a massive granite deposit reported to be 35 miles long, 6 miles wide, and as many as 3 miles deep. In other words, it was the perfect site for a thought-provoking stone monument that had scientists, scholars, zealots, occultists, and conspiracy theories all worked up since it was unveiled in 1980. It all started in the summer of 1979, when a well-dressed man using the alias R.C. Christian walked into the office of the Elberton Granite Finishing Corporation. Meeting with the company's president, Mr. Christian informed him that he represented a group of secretive and wealthy out-of-state investors who for nearly two decades had been working on a project with important implications for future generations. The company was hired to build a massive granite monument, and its employees were sworn to strict secrecy. 
Then, less than a year later, on March 22, 1980, the rough-hewn stone structure consisted of six individual slabs standing over 19 feet tall and weighing nearly 240,000 pounds, that's over 100,000 kilograms, was unveiled before a crowd of 100. One man, a local pastor, immediately declared that it was obviously the work of devil worshippers after reading ten tenets carved into the stones. On each side of the capstone in four ancient languages was carved the phrase, Let these be guidestones to an age of reason. Likewise, in English, Russian, Mandarin, Arabic, Hebrew, Swahili, Hindi, and Spanish, the following cryptic instructions for rebuilding society after the inevitable doomsday were engraved. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Unite humanity with a living new language. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Balance personal rights with social duties. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. Be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. His job done, the mysterious Mr. Christian was never seen again, but before disappearing, he left a smaller stone tablet explaining the astrological significance of the stone's placement in relation to the North Star, solstices, and equinoxes. Many indignant detractors looked no further than the Guidestone's reference to maintaining the world's population under 500 million. It's an odd and undoubtedly intentional choice of words, considering that in 1980 the world's population was about 4.4 billion. In fact, it begs the question, how should the population be reduced to 500 million in the first place? Some see this statement alone as irrefutable proof that the stone's creators were aligned with the mysterious New World Order and eugenics movements whose dastardly aims purportedly included reducing the number of humans to more sustainable levels and improving the quality of genetics by culling undesirable segments of the population through genocide, plague, forced birth control, and starvation. I would personally say that's a bit of a stretch. Aren't they just building this so that if the world is destroyed, people can look at it and be like, okay, that's a good idea, that's a good idea, maybe we should ignore the, uh, <laughs> the genetics one. But the others, you know, they seem okay. On the other hand, some famous figures like Yoko Ono <laughs> praise the Guidestone's practicality and promotion of balance and harmony. Because if there's anyone we should be looking to for advice on things, it's Yoko Ono. Though the stones drew relatively little attention in the 80s and 90s, more recently they found themselves in the international spotlight and have been vandalized repeatedly. We may never know who made the stones or what exactly they mean. <laughs> Despite being polite, educated, and multilingual, Henry de Bosnese had been labeled as a lazy sociopath, an egotistical genius, a mass murderer, a madman, and a psychopath. Though they're not mutually exclusive descriptions, whatever he was, before his execution in 1882, he left behind a unique manuscript known as the de Bosnese ciphers. His identity has never been definitively established, but from what has been pieced together from his past, he was born in either France or Portugal and emigrated to the United States in the 1830s. Though next to nothing is known about his family, or his childhood, the handsome, dapper, and well-spoken Mr. de Bosny has left in his wake a trail of at least two wealthy dead wives across the continent, and possibly more. His American troubles began in early 1882 when he arrived in Essex County, New York, aboard a luxurious yacht that had departed from nearby Philadelphia just a few days before. Shortly after his arrival, he met, courted, and eventually married the well-to-do local widow Elizabeth Wells. And it's not going to shock you, but poor Elizabeth turned up dead in the summer of that same year, found strangled in the forest just outside side of Westport, New York, after a picnic with de Bosnese, who apparently had been seen leaving the scene and acting peculiarly. De Bosnese was subsequently captured, arrested, and convicted after a trial that supposedly took less than 10 minutes. Justice in the past. He proclaimed his innocence and undying love for his wife until the bitter end, and while in jail awaiting execution by hanging, he produced a body of work including romantic poems, macabre drawings, and bizarre cryptograms, many of which haven't been deciphered to this day. However, some were written in plain English, like this excerpt from one of his poems. And free from the old world it is, I will visit the heaven with mine. Of course it's possible that the cryptic portions of the text aren't coded messages at all, but the incomprehensible rantings of a misanthropic murderer with a hopelessly deranged mind. Either way, writing and cryptography experts who've studied his work agree that it does contain portions inspired at least in part by hieroglyphics, much of which includes pictures of trees, snakes, horses, and suns, some of which have been linked to Masonic symbolism, only deepening the mystery. There are also portions of writing in Greek, Portuguese, and Latin that may give glimpses into his early life and education. Though the case of Henry de Bosnese remained a source of interest in local law, it was largely forgotten about nationally, and it wasn't until a book titled Adirondack Enigma was published by Sherry Farnsworth in 2010 that efforts to decode the enigma picked up steam once again, but 
to no avail. In an enticingly macabre ending to a particularly sordid tale, for years, Henry de Beausigny's skull has been enclosed in a glass case and displayed in a rarely visited corner of the Adirondack History Center Museum in Elizabethtown, New York, along with historical accounts of his life and memorabilia from the trial and execution, including the actual noose used to hang him after his sentence was handed down. That is a grim museum. De Bosnese also holds the distinction of being the last man ever hanged in Essex County, of which he was the second and by far the most famous. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out Beardblaze, beardblaze.com. If you've got a beard that needs taking care of, this is for you. And thank you for watching.